Hi, I'm Brett Jennings, and for the last 12 years, I've traveled the country to meet, mentor, and mastermind with some of the brightest and best minds both inside and outside of real estate. I've taken those ideas, brought them back to our team of experts, and sold hundreds of homes per year all across Silicon Valley, and this is how we do it. Our topic today is top agent secrets for investing and year-end tax strategies. Uh, I'm Brett Jennings, your host and moderator today, and I'm actually super excited about this topic um, about wealth building and year-end tax strategies. As we speak, um, I'm actually out of town at a, a leadership retreat, but I just spent a day doing homework on a couple different year-end investments myself. So, um, but I'm super excited and, and pleased to be a company today by two peers, I'd call them both friends and mentors that you're going to hear from, as well as a, a third, Jeremiah. Uh, how do I pronounce your last name, Jeremiah? So I'm mute there. Boucher. Boucher. Like Bobby Boucher, yeah. Jeremiah Boucher. So um, three, what I would call uh, very astute investors, um, both Aaron and Daniel, like myself, and most of you online, um, are in the business of real estate, right? We sell real estate. Uh, and I'd like to say, you know, when we all start the journey of becoming an agent, whatever brought you into the industry or the business, most people get into real estate. So eventually they can get out of real estate. And the topic that we're going to talk about today is that wealth building journey. But what's specifically timely, timely about it, right, is the year end tax strategies. Um, both uh, our panelists, Aaron West and Daniel Del Real, are people that you are going to want to listen to closely. And the reason I say that is because they're not just successful agents. These are both agents that sell, uh, started out as individual agents. They grew very successful businesses and now run very successful teams that will both net them each over seven figures in income in their business. You know, and, and, uh, but more importantly, they, in addition to being agents, have been on the wealth building journey and have built eight figure net worths uh, themselves through the process of taking the real estate profits, investing them in the real in the real estate. And so we're going to talk about um, that journey and really what you might need to be thinking about uh, in that journey. And one of the things that we are going to kick it off with is some introductions. And let's go ahead and uh, start with you, Aaron. Tell us a little bit about yourself, how long you've been in the real estate business and how long you've been investing. And then we'll turn it over to Daniel. Uh, th th first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, it's exciting to be here and be able to share, you know, our journey with uh, with all of you. So again, Aaron West, uh, my office is in Modesto, California, as is Daniel's. Both of us run the, the top two teams really in the Central Valley. Um, I got into real estate in 2005. So I had a couple of easy sales and then the market hit and then the real world hit. And so really built my business through the Great Recession uh, by myself, started building a team in 2017. Uh, we now have, we've actually just had a lot of growth this year. I stepped out of production this year and got out of my own way, which I think is uh, something that we all have a problem with and started adding to the team. So we have a total team of 14 now with uh, seven agents, but really there were five producing agents and we'll do right at 200 transactions this year. I started investing, so, so like a lot of agents, I out-earned my spending for most of my life. So I was, I was dead broke for most of my life, no matter how much money I made. And I bought my first property in 2011. So that was really the start of my investing journey was 2011. 2011, so you've been at it for about 10 years now. 10 years now, yes. 10 years to 10 million is a, a pretty promising uh, and And trajectory. to be totally transparent, I'm not quite at 10 million yet, but I will be by the end of this next year. Yeah, you're, you're, you're uh, well, you're mighty close. <laughs> I'm mighty uh, close. So, so with that, uh, I want to introduce Daniel. Daniel, tell us a little bit about yourself, your business, and how long you've been investing. You're on mute, so I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute. There we go. All right. Um, Daniel Del Rio, uh, like Aaron said, I'm out of the Central Valley, also in the real estate uh, industry. I've been in the business for going on 19 years now. Uh, had a, been building a team for the last 11. 
uh, we, um, I mean, it, we're pretty productive. I mean, we have a, I think our team is slightly larger than Aaron's. We have 13 agents and uh, 11 um, admins. So it's a total, a total of 24 people, um, but we'll end up moving close to 500 units. Um, so um, we've, we've, uh, We've been able to to do that just through through systems and just relationships that we've had here. But you know, really, when I started my real estate career, I got lucky. I was uh, born um, in an immigrant family. My parents came from Mexico. Didn't have much. My dad never really made more than forty seven thousand dollars a year and raised five kids with it. So I was able to see what my dad did, not on how much he earned, but what he did with the money he earned. Uh, so I got, I get, I could say my first real estate transaction was signing loan docs and being there signing loan docs with my mom and dad at the age of 10 or 11, uh, because they didn't know English. So I had to be there to kind of make sure that the numbers were what the numbers were, even though I didn't know half the, the stuff that I was looking at. Um, so I, I got really lucky. I got exposure there quickly. And um, I spent four years in the Air Force as a cop, my degrees in criminal justice, uh, I ended up seeing the movie uh, uh, Hollywood Undercover with Harrison Ford, where he was a cop and, and a real estate agent at the same time. So I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do that. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> 20 years later, I'm, I'm still selling real estate. Right. But um, I bought my first house uh, the first year I got into the business. So I bought my first house in 2000. Uh, I believe it was 2003. And of course, the market tank. I still own that property to this day. We got some some serious lessons in um in the volatility of the market. Um, and it just, you know, just came came out stronger than ever uh, doing that. And I just been uh, very faithfully every single year investing in, in real estate um, from, you know, back from 2004 to, I mean, this year, we we just, this quarter, we closed on two fairly large properties. So um, I've been able to see some of those properties mature. Um, I see Jeremiah is also on the call. He's part of um, the commercial academy program that I'm also part of. Very smart guy. I've, I've built a lot of my wealth, not just on my back, but on the back of very smart people like Jeremiah uh, that have amazing opportunities. And, and I, I have, you know, I am not at all ashamed to surf other people's wakes, right? So uh, people have done that to me when they were coming into the Valley asking and getting my advice when we we're buying houses here. And, and I'm now doing that uh, to, to people around my sphere that are just amazing operators. So yeah. that's my story. Awesome. Well, well, I, I thank you um, for, for both telling your story and for that influence, because you personally have impacted, um, you know, my, my trajectory uh, from when we, I think, first met in 2015 uh, through the, the mastermind group GoBundance. Um, you know, that experience and some of your input and guidance along the way has helped me kind of 15x uh, where I've been financially over, you know, just that six year period of time. So it is amazing when, when you really, um, you know, find good mentors and, and people who are, you know, at the level where you want to be and, and then follow their advice. Um, you know, I like to say, I don't need to be the smartest kid in class. I just need to sit next to them and take really good notes. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that um, I've done well is, is sought out people like yourself. And Brett, um, Brett, I'll yeah. steal his answers. I don't, I won't even take his notes. I'll just straight up steal his answers. So it's a favorite thing, you know, it's uh, R and D rip off and, and duplicate, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's, that's the principle that I, I learned in my experience in working with Tony Robbins, but for, for those um, of those you who don't might not know me um, on the call uh, here, my name is Brett Jennings. Uh, I lead a real estate team uh, and a real estate brokerage, a new model of real estate brokerage called a team ridge, which is like a hybrid between a team and a brokerage. And what we do is specialize in helping uh, mid-level producers become top producers or help top producers become top performing teams by providing them a platform of leads, systems, amazing administrative support and marketing so that they can double or triple their business. So uh, obviously we do that. And so I, I've been running that real estate team and group and I started investing um, really in about 2015 myself and um, made the journey to, to build a, a multiple seven figure, now eight figure net worth um, through applying everything that we're going to talk about here. So let's dive into it, gentlemen. Um, I think what we first want to talk about, uh, Daniel and Aaron, is, is the fundamentals. And when we talk about fundamentals, I want to give a word of warning to everybody online. And when I say a word of, a word of warning, um, 
when we talk about fundamentals, there's a tendency, right, to say something internally in your own mind. And that is most, the most dangerous words you can say to yourself is, I already know that. Okay. When you say, I already know that, um, that's great. But the question is, you know it, but are you doing it? So as we dive into fundamentals, um, Daniel, Aaron, like what, what, when, when people are starting out on this wealth building journey, when you see them, you know, agents so much of the time, right. We're running and gunning. We're like, especially in a year, like we've had just this past year where prices ran up 25%, number of transactions went up 70%. You know, as I opened up the, sent out this email invite, I was said, you know, your best year ever, most everybody's had their best year ever. But the question is, do they, do they know where they really are? So let's, um, let's talk about fundamentals in that first step of what you guys really feel is important on the wealth building journey. Um, so, Aaron, you, you know, I, I think, I think first thing, the first problem that a lot of agents have is they associate their bank account with how they're doing financially. So they have a great year and they've got money in the bank. So they're like, I'm really good. But, but at the end of the day, that's, that's really not how you're judged at the end of the game, right? The goal at the end of the game is for us to be wealthy. Every single one of us, we have the opportunity to be wealthy in real estate. And it starts with knowing a couple of things. One is understanding what your own relationship with money looks like, because most of us have a pretty jacked up relationship with money, truthfully, because there, it comes from a place of fear for a lot of us. If you're a spender, which is what I was, you're afraid of having money. So you can make as much money as you can, but you're going to spend it because you're afraid of having it. Or if you're a saver, you're afraid of losing money. And so it's um, really important that you take a deep dive into your own personal relationship with money and then figure out what a healthy relationship with money looks like as well. Um, the second thing is, is knowing your net worth. And I mean, I, I, I can't see, uh, most people just have their pictures up right here. But I would be really interested to see how many people on this call actually know what their net worth is. Well, let's, and, let's call that. Let's call that out. Let's uh, let's let's ask in the chat there. Um, how many of you uh, on this call? And just I want to we want to evoke some participation here. Go ahead and drop it in the chat um, if you know today what your net worth is, uh, including and, your home equity. And just so you know, there's no judgment at all in this. This is just this is just the reality of the world that we live in. I was on a call a couple of days ago talking to a, a really successful team on the East Coast, and there were 29 of his top agents there, and only one knew their net worth. And, and so if you don't, there's no shame in it. That's the way most of the world is. So yeah, just by, by a show, um, yeah, I, I see some people saying no clue. Uh, what do we got? varies daily uh actually we've got some smart people on the call we've uh i see kenny tronk says yes joe stiber yes 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 i see joe frizzano in there saying yes yeah. he updated quarterly no 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 clue varies daily so why is it important um aaron in your opinion you know as you start this journey for wealth building to have that dialed down because um what is i can't remember how the expression goes but what, what is measured grows right? If you don't know what it is, you have no way to know if you are improving on it or you're doing the same thing that you've always done or if it's going down. And it really doesn't matter what the number is. When I, when I first did my net worth, I was negative $50,000 in debt. So it, it, I've been there. We, we are, have all been in different places, but it's your batting average. And once you start taking it, paying attention to it and seeing what that number is, then you start changing your decisions because if you if you improve your net worth by a thousand dollars, that is a win. And and most people don't think of it that way, but the reality is is every single dollar that I improve my net worth by is a dollar that I can go to work with for the next thirty years. And so I think that, and I'd love to hear Daniel's opinion on that as well. But I think net worth is probably one of the most important numbers that you need to know on this journey to be able to be successful and, and, and create wealth in real estate. I, I, you touch on so many important things there. I remember my journey as an agent, becoming a successful agent, like you said, then now kind of evaluating your sense of self-worth on what's in your bank account. You're like, oh my God, I'm making more money than ever. But then realizing, you know, when I look back, it, I didn't really begin the wealth building trajectory until I started getting focused really on what that number was. Like you're saying, you know, what you measure, you can manage and what you manage, you can improve. Um, 
So, Daniel, you have any thoughts on that or, or yeah, other, I do. other I, things that, yeah. that people should be focused on and measuring? Because like in our real estate business, like we, we, we track stuff, right? Like how many appointments does it take to, to get a buyer into contract or how many appointments does it take to get a listing? Um, but but people don't seem to do that. So what, what else should they be tracking? Yeah, you know, the KPIs and in, in, in your, your own financial house, I think self-reflection is one of the best things and just taking massive ownership to where you're at today. Uh, when we start making a lot of money, I see a lot of agents trying to find their significant significance on, on like material things, cars, uh, trips, bottle service, all this other stuff, just frivolous spending, right? Um, and then it gets, you know, then it gets a little, a little out of hand instead of really uh, being a good steward of the, of the money and, and the talents that you've got. Um, and, and then play massive defense. And then just knowing the difference, the, the difference between, you know, uh, what you make and what you spend and what you, not only what you save, but what you invest. And I was able to see my dad do it at $47,000 a year, you know? So I know a lot of people on this call, especially a lot of people in, 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 in the business right now, um, they're, they're, there's a lot of ability for you guys to grow wealth. But my dad, what he mastered is his ability to go without, right? And that's one of the best quotes I like is a, a person's, wealth is best measured by his ability to go without and he was able to go without with with a lot you know the neighbors had new cars nice cars awesome vacations all this cool stuff they found a lot of uh significance in that and 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 he invested in himself and and now he's able to retire so what Aaron says is, is spot on um, I don't think he would have been able to do that if he didn't have his house in order and he didn't know exactly what his burn rate was. Um, and once you know that, then then you could really start playing the game, right? Saying, okay, where am I today? Doesn't matter how good, how bad it is. Then at that point, now you have a measurement to, to look at to say, okay, what do I want to do here in the next 12 months? What do I want to uh, save? What do I want to invest? In? And then you become a better steward of, of the money. And a lot of that comes with the tax strategy plan of it is, is it's hard to really say like, we're going to get into some tax strategies that, and I'll show you some of the numbers that, that you guys will, will, will get. Oh man, that's amazing. But if you don't start doing the work today uh, to be a good steward of that money, playing defense to position yourself in a, in a, in, in a position to be able to take advantage of investments and leverage and fixed assets and, 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 uh, and uh, cost seg studies and all this fun stuff that we're going to talk about, then it's on you. Because you have to take the steps prior to be able to take advantage of the opportunities that you'll create for yourself by doing that. And a lot of it is separating yourself from your money. How do you do that? First thing, we'll dive, diving right in. Corporation. Are you incorporated? I'd like to hear better than if your net, what your net worth is. Is, are, is If you're in sales, are you incorporated? Did you separate and detach yourself from the money? Uh, then once you do self-discovery, you're talking about, okay, how much do I need to live on? Because remember, my dad, $47,000 a year, his race is a lot shorter than my race, right? I need a couple hundred grand to live on, right? So I got a longer race uh, and, and it's self-inflicted. Right? Some people on this call might need a hundred grand. Some people might need a half a million, right? So uh, by, by doing, uh, you know, just self-reflection and looking at your own stuff, you say, okay, what, what is it? that I really need to live on and how long do I want my race to be? Now you have a number to shoot for. And like you said, what gets measured gets improved on expands, and, right? And yeah. I would just add this too. Um, you know, it's, I, I think that, and, and I know Brett and I know Daniel and I know myself, one of the, one of the reasons why we've been able to build wealth is because we put ourselves on a salary and that salary was a number that we could live on comfortably. I, I, I personally hate the word budget because I think of when everybody thinks of the word budget, it's tightening your belt as tight as you can, going without, giving yourself $18 to, to eat food for the rest of the month. And, and that's just not reality, right? Nobody, very few people can hold to that. So what my wife and I did, and I know Daniel does this as well because we've talked about it, is we said, what is a number that we can live comfortably on by which we're not not wanting. And so we came up with that number and we've lived on that number for seven years. We've had the exact same salary. Now, full disclosure, the business pays for travel. You know, that is some of the advantages of having a corporation and doing some of these, these strategies is that you can move some of your life into your business. But at the end of the day, we held to that number really, really strong. And everything else that that corporation made or that my real estate team makes is not my money. That's my money to invest. 
that's my money to become the person who I know I have the ability to be. And that's the money that's going to make it easier for me. So we've and, lived on the same salary. And so has Daniel. Go ahead, Daniel. No, and that separation is exactly what's important, right? They always say ownership sinks stewardship. The person that knows that the best is the federal government. A W-2 employee uh, doesn't get the money, right? They, they don't get the, they, they take the taxes before they get the deposit. They know that, that as soon as that person takes the money, now that stewardship might be sunk because now you have ownership of it. You're, you're itching to spend it and, and, and have fun with it, right? Uh, so, so like what, what Aaron says about creating a corporation and separating yourself from the money will we'll let you honor that stewardship saying, okay, now uh, I develop a business plan. Let me, let me see if I could, I could invest in my business to hire somebody, which then will create more growth. Um, like Aaron in 2010, I put myself on a salary and I kept it literally until three years ago when when a couple of abundance guys started kicking my ass because I was being I was living in scarcity, they said, right? And you live my life in abundance. So they forced me to take vacations. They forced me to do a bunch of cool stuff, which which I, I'm glad they did. But but a lot of a lot of my success is not because I was the smartest guy in the world. The thing is, is I had really good systems in place, like a salary and a, and a budget that I lived on for so long that regardless whether my income ballooned up to seven figures plus, I was living on 110,000 a year and it was $6,700 net to my bank academy a month. And that's what I lived on. Uh, so so uh, the power of it is like, look, I had goals to have a large net worth. I had goals for investments and passive income, but everybody does. Everybody has those goals to be financially free. But if you don't have the system, then you're not gonna you're not gonna raise to the level of your goals. You're gonna fall to the level of whatever system you put in place. Incorporating yourself, separating yourself from the money, creating a different bank account. All those are systems to protect you from yourself. Right. Yeah. Agreed. And you, you go touched ahead. on so much. You touched on so much there in this section on fundamentals that I think I just want to I want to recap and relate it to my own experience because unlike you, Daniel, and um, you know I'm I'm not as disciplined as you. When I started on my wealth building journey, uh, when I got into real estate, I was spending more than I was making, you know, and I was in debt. And, and maybe some of the people who are on the call are in that, in that zone. Um, but if I look back where I really started to make positive progress was when I set up a corporation. And when I got clear, like we were talking about, what's our net worth? Number one. Number two, what's your burn rate? What is your monthly cost of living? And then number three, What's your income? Now, our income in real estate is going to go up and down, but at least now I know uh, what what my burn rate is. I need to earn at least 150% of that uh, or more if I'm going to be paying taxes. And if I want to have anything left to invest, I've got to make even more than that. And that's kind of where my journey started. But if I look back, it was setting up the corporation and putting myself on a salary. And I knew what that nut was. And so now I know, okay, over and above what I make on that plus taxes now is my, my net investable income. So I think, um, I think that that really is true when we talk about those fundamentals. Let's, let's move on and talk kind of about what, what's next in this um, process of wealth building. So we're clear on where we are. We know what our net worth is. We know what our burn rate is. We know what our, our monthly income is because ultimately you know, your ability, you have to spend less than you earn and invest the difference. But when we talk about investing, and the path to financial freedom, I think part of that is, is getting clear, right, with a plan. So um, maybe, maybe, maybe you want to start with this one first, um, Daniel, because you are, uh, you know, what we call affectionately a hundred percenter. Maybe you want to explain what being a hundred percenter is on this path to financial freedom, because, you know, part of what makes financial independence, financial freedom unattainable for some is because it's not quantified. It feels like this thing that's way out there in the future. And I'm going to need 15 million bucks or whatever it is to really be able to retire in this crazy expensive Bay area. So how do people kind of, how did you chart that initial course to figure out what, what do I need to have in, in net investments or what's my, my path to becoming financially free? So part of, of, of knowing your numbers is we call it a, that like 100 percent or means that 100 percent of your expenses gets covered by your 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 passive income meaning you go from needing to go to work to choosing to go to work and the beauty in that is as soon as you get to choose you approach work your clients your team a lot different because now you're choosing that responsibility right like you created that for yourself um, so a, a lot of that when it comes down to the strategy behind it is once you have your house in order Right. Once you know exactly what it is that you need to live on, 
what kind of passive income you're going to need. Um, now you're going to have to start playing defense. And I think Susanna said it is that taxes is a huge impact on your net worth. She typed it in in the, in the comments. And it's true, right? I mean, your taxes are going to just, they're going to kill you. You could, growing your net worth, um, tax, post-tax or, or pre-tax or post-tax is, is massive in your net worth. Um, so once you get there and you, you do that self-discovery, you find out what your expenses are, then at that point, you have to uh, bet on yourself. So a lot of agents won't incorporate themselves because the story they tell themselves is, uh, well, I don't have a business. Uh, well, I don't, I don't need it yet. I'm not there yet. And it, we're very reactive in doing what we need, um, like two steps after we need it. Like the pressure's on, now we need to hire somebody, right? Instead of hiring to where we're going, right? Uh, look, I, I'm gonna hire this person because I am going here, right? And you, 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 uh, and you position yourself to do that. So. Once you do the accountability part of it, you incorporate yourself because you're going to need it. If you execute the plan and you have the systems in place, the score will take care of itself. So you have to now bet on yourself, incorporate yourself, divide the funds, uh, set up a corporate account, you know, hire a bookkeeper. You don't need a you don't need to hire a, um, an attorney for to incorporate yourself. You could do it on on LegalZoom. I would suggest that you talk to your CPA and, and, and your bookkeeper to get it done properly. But that would be the first initial steps to saying, okay, let's go. I got a launch pad. I am willing to bet on myself and invest in my own future is, is by doing that. And everybody on my team, uh, they're all there. I think for the most part, they're all incorporated if they've been with me for longer than six, six months to a year. Um, because the, the tax strategy there and the ability to build wealth and shelter some of those gains by incorporating yourself is massive, including self-employment tax, right? Self-employment tax is 15%. Right. Going from uh, an individual to a corporation, that alone will pay the entry for this call that you're on right now. Right. Which was I think it was free. Right. <laughs> so, uh, but it allows you to play that game to win. Right. Yeah. So, Aaron, what what are your thoughts on on kind of these? I call them there's like there's five. I think there's five milestones. Right. To 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 financial freedom and the work that I did with Tony Robbins when we went through his um, wealth mastery program. You know, he, he talks about their, the goal is financial freedom. That's where, you know, the income from your investments exceeds your, your living expenses, as Daniel called it, being 100 percenter. But there's some milestones along the way. Number one, first thing you want to do is create financial protection. So if you don't have it, make sure that you got six months of living expenses and cash reserves. The second one would be financial security, where you have 12 months uh, of living expenses in either cash reserves or, or easily uh, convertible to cash equivalents, you know, whether that's a CD uh, or stocks or something that's fairly liquid. Um, beyond that, I think is where we start talking about building passive income and getting to the level where you're financially independent would be stage three. And that's where, where your basics, your mortgage, your car payment, uh, the, the essential necessities, mm -hmm of your life are covered by your passive income. Um, and then beyond that, obviously, then you get to financial freedom where your passive income is, is, is covered by your investment income. And so Aaron, what's been kind of your formula as you go to set those goals and lay that out? So, you know, I think on, on these events, it's super easy to get just, just so much information. It's getting, it's drinking water from a fire hose, right? So I try and keep it as simple as I can because I'm just not that smart, truthfully. You know, so the three steps so far that we've covered is know your net worth, form a corporation, put yourself on a salary. Those are the first three steps. Everything else is like ancillary information that, that's come through, right? So for me, once you've done those three things, the next part is going and, and one of my mentors said this to me and, and you know how you have those moments in your life where it's it's a conversation that only lasts 30 seconds but it changes the path of your entire life and and one of my mentors his name is Tim Rhodes said this really early on in my journey he said Aaron people get rich hitting base hits and then he explained that to me and he said what that means is most people want to take ten thousand dollars and turn it into $100,000 in one deal. And he said, the only thing that happens right for that is disaster. What, but if you just use the baseball analogy, you've got your guys that, that 
step up in one year, they hit 70 home runs, and then you never hear about them again because all they try and do is hit home runs, and it's one year, and then they're out of the leagues, right? But the guy that steps up to the plate every single time, and he's like, I'm going to put the ball between the shortstop and the third baseman, or I'm going to put it between the first and second baseman, and all he's ever trying to do is hit base hits, he's in the league forever, and he's consistent for a long period of time and every once in a while that ball will hit the bat perfectly and then bloop over someone's head and it turns into a double and then once in a blue moon he'll take a swing and it'll just be a fastball and make a total flush contact and he hits a home run but it's the anomaly not the norm but in our wealth building journey if you can take ten thousand dollars and turn it into an eleven thousand dollars that's a win and, and if you do that enough times, that's how you build wealth. So to me, you know, the, the next thing is just understanding that you get wealthy by consistently hitting base hits over a long period of time. It's boring and it sucks and it's a lot of hard work. And anybody who tells you that it's not is just bald face lying to you. But changing your mindset of people want to get rich quick, but life is long. Yeah. You know, bre bread is a 10 year journey. For me, it's been a 10 year journey to get where we're at right now. And it's 10 years of being really consistent. So the, the fourth step to me is just start looking for base hits. Start looking for base hits. Well, that, um, you know, that that's consistent with, with a, a friend of ours in our, our real estate investor group that we've, that, that is, uh, I don't think he's a centimillionaire at this point, centimillionaire, somebody has over a hundred million. They've, uh, they've built, grown and built their wealth too. And um, one of the things he said, you know, getting wealthy requires taking risk. Staying wealthy requires minimizing risk. So there will be some risk to take, but, um, you know, the, the, one of the core principles in that, the first principle is don't lose money. Uh, and, and how do you not lose money? In, don't invest in anything you don't understand. I mean, here in real estate, we have the opportunity because we have our eyes and ears on stuff um, that we can take advantage of and do really well with. And I, when I look back at my own personal experience, the only times that I've lost money is when I've gone into a market I didn't know and I didn't understand the dynamics of that market. And that was a painful experience. I did a $4 million flip in Carmel uh, with a partner and uh, we relied on the advice of one agent, didn't, didn't get a second opinion and that ended up costing us 750 grand. But, you know, my share of that, my $50,000, I saw it as a tuition um, because I'd much rather lose $250,000 on a $3 million investment than two and a half million on a 30. So, um, Daniel, what, uh, what are your thoughts on these principles of uh, now, now we're, we've gone, gone from knowing where we are, no. knowing, getting our financial house in order, but to actual investment. Okay. Daniel, we had somebody. What, what, what was the question again? Sorry, we had. Somebody. Oh, that's all right. No, I was just saying, go, dovetailing on the, the. You know, we're talking now about the prince, the actual principles of investing. We talked about mm -hmm. first. First part was getting your financial house in order. Now we're talking about investing, and and Aaron mentioned this principle of get base hits. Like, yeah. don't lose, don't lose money. Yeah, get get base hits gets you on base. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, you'll get an, a GP um, that will hit a home run for you and just bring you home, right? Which is cool. But a lot of it is investing. So if you if you take those steps, and honestly, like the rest of this is bonus for everybody else, like more inspiration. Because I think if you do those four steps, if that's the, the the only things you do, you're winning, right? And then you could add on to that, right? Which you you be you could expand to that. But part of taking and investing is how can I do it. Um, pre-tax, right? That's where the magic happens, right? That's what I'd like to talk about because, yeah. you know, when you, when you go and you make a dollar, right? So you say you make 10,000 bucks, I got 10,000 bucks. Uh, and then you go, uh, say, say it's a hundred grand and you buy a car, right? Well, you bought a car and if, if you can't write off that car, then you had to earn close to 140,000 to spend a hundred thousand, right? I mean, think about it. And then once you spend that hundred thousand, they're also going to tax you another 10% when you spend it. So you almost have to earn 150 grand to spend 100 grand. Think about that. So um, whenever you could, you could, you could invest uh, pre-tax, and then with that pre-tax money, spend that. That's where the magic happens, right? And I think, I think, I think you touched on something there, which, which is at the core of what I, 
we're, we're, we're going to dive deep into here, but I want people to understand, you know, the real difference between having a thoughtful approach and strategy about minimizing your taxes, not only on your income, because we, with the, the core premise of building wealth, right, is you have to spend less than you earn and invest the difference. If you do nothing, like if you have a kick-ass year this year and you're making 250, 350, 500,000, and you do you know, at 500,000, let's say in California, and you do nothing to mitigate your taxes, guess what? They're going to take 51% of your gross income between federal and state, 38% fed and 13% state. Now, when we talk about having, so if, you, if you do that, right, half of it's gone. So um, we're going to dive into this tax section, but I also want to touch on the importance of, of tax advantage investing and what it means to your net worth. So my business prior to getting into real estate, I was in financial services and I worked with a tax planning attorney. And I, this one example he told me told, all for, will forever stand out in my mind. He said, Brett, here's the way it works with tax advantage investing. If you take $1 and you double it every year, okay? Dollar, double it every year for 20 years, you'll end up with $1,048,000, okay? So $1 doubling it every year at the end of 10 years, you know, you have $1,024. At the end of 15 years, you know, you, you've got uh, you've got several hundred thousand dollars. And at the end, I'm sorry, yeah, several hundred thousand. At the end of 20 years, you have a million 48. Now, you take that same dollar that at the end of 20 years doubling, you have a million 48, you tax it at 40% at the end of every year, okay? At the end of 20 years, you don't end up with a million 48. You don't, don't end up with 500,000. You don't end up with 200,000. You don't even end up with 100,000. You end up with $14,500, okay? That's the advantage of tax deferred growth on your investments. So as we dive into this next section, if there's, you know, once you've got that financial house in order, you really wanna focus on strategies, both to minimize taxes on your income and, the, 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 the growth on the, the investment, uh, your, your investment tax, your investment dollars. So um, Daniel and Aaron, both, both of you guys, I know you and I talked before the call. We, I wanted to kind of go through and, and let's give them a tactical hit list of some of the things um, that they could be thinking about and doing to prepare now before the end of the year. Uh, what are some of those things that they should be thinking about um, between now and the end of the year? You all do one, then you do one, Daniel. So if you have kids, pay your kids. You can pay them $13,000 a year. They have, if they are in any of your marketing at all, if they're in your Facebook marketing or your Instagram marketing and you're showing your kids, they are actors. They can be paid for that service. They can be paid $13,200 a year and there's zero tax paid on that. So if you have two kids, that's $26,000 that you can write them checks that there's zero tax paid on it. I've taken Good. advantage of that one too. Yeah, I think I think a lot of that too comes with being incorporated, right? Uh, renting your your own place, right? Renting a home office is is another easy way to get twelve grand off your, you know, off your income. Yeah, uh, you know, and, 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 and if, if you don't have, I mean, like we, like we did that when I when I had an office at the office and we I didn't have an office at home. This is pre COVID. Uh, we took advantage of that deduction the way I did it. We had four quarterly meetings um, every. We had a meeting every quarter for my, my team and my business. I'd, I'd bring them over and I'd bill back. Um, I would bill back my company uh, for for that rental. And that was, is it 12,000? No, it can, be, it, it can be like any that. number. It can be any number at all, Brett. It's called the Augusta rule. And yeah. you can rent your, your personal residence. You can rent your vacation residence or your second home out for up to 14 days pay yourself out of your corporation and there's zero taxes on it. It just has to be the rents that you charge have to be market rents for like an Airbnb, or if there was an event in your area, what would the prices be for that? So you mm -hmm. can actually do that on multiple homes. And I saw someone put in a question, does, is there an age limit for that? There is not for your kids writing them a check. They could be six months old and they are actors or actresses or models in your marketing plan and therefore they can be paid. Just yeah, if, if, if the reason why you keep it under a certain amount is to avoid having to file a full tax return, right? Um, so you got to check with your CPA on that. 
you know, I pay my kids um, 27, 28,000 a year. I file taxes for my kids, right? My, my seven, nine and 11 year old pay taxes, but they pay a lot lower taxes than I pay. So I'd happily pay taxes on them and they have their own deductions. And actually they all got a credit from the government last month in their bank accounts because they file taxes. Um, so, so, but you got to check with your CPA on it, but you can go up uh, higher. Uh, one thing I would caution you is if your kids are, you know, 18, 19 and they're earning income, you, you gotta you gotta make sure that you're gonna you're gonna affect that or if they're going for any kind of financial aid. Yeah. Um, another one that uh, that I it's a simple one, right? It is maxing out your tax efficient accounts like your 401k, your IRA, or if you're self employed, you can set up a SEP, a SEP IRA. Uh, you can cram as much as fifty eight thousand dollars into that between uh, now. I think someone can correct me because uh, I'm not a CPA. I'm not licensed to give tax advice. It's interesting. We're talking about this stuff, but you know, max out your SEP or your, uh, your IRA uh, SEPs. I think you can put up to 58,000 if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, and that, that will help whittle down your tax bill. Um, Daniel, what are like, I know you, you've invested in some tax efficient investments, like things that, um, oil and gas, for example, yeah. where, you know, these are alternative investments, bonds, muni bonds, or another, another type of tax advantage investment. But, but explain to uh, us a little bit about like, you know, when you did an oil uh, investment in oil and gas, what uh, for, for long-term passive income, you got a deduction for that investment up, up front? Yeah, I did. I ended up getting a uh, 67% tax deduction. And then I have uh, well, you know, there's risk to that as well, because, you know, you need to make sure that it produces, right? Uh, but if it does produce and you have a, a 15 year period where it pays you out, uh, depending on what, where the prices are, um, but you get the deduction right away. And it, that's more like an of a, of a income method. It's not a way to build wealth, but it's a, strat chat, a tax strategy and it creates income. Uh, that's something that we've done. We've also done and these are being looked at, but we've done uh, land easements as well, right? Which which has give, given us a pretty pretty large deduction. Sometimes three to one, four to one, five to one. So meaning you put fifty thousand in something like that, you get up to two hundred thousand in in a, in a deduction. Um, we've done um, and we've done the, the my favorite one, the one that I like the best is uh, purchasing real estate, right? Because not only are you uh, buying a fixed asset, fixed debt with cash flow. You're using leverage, so it's an inflation bet, and there's a massive tax advantage to it. Um, and that's that's like my go-to. But if I can't find a property, I'll look to fill in with some of the other things. So and, let's and, let's, and let's, just, let's talk about on. that. Let's let's unpack that a little bit because um, what we're what you're introducing there, I think you're talking about cost segregation. Are you? And yeah. and Brett, can I say something before yeah. before we get sure. into that? So what sure. Daniel's talking about right now, those are all like those are college level courses. And, and, you know, I haven't, I haven't done those things because I haven't gotten to the financial place where Daniel is truthfully. So, so when you hear some of us talk about some of these things, there are things that you can do today to implement that can save taxes. And then there are things that are master's degree stuff. And so when you talk about land easements and you talk about oil and gas and, and some of these other ones, those are those are pretty far down the road from for most of us. So just to be clear, don't go out and start talking to people about land easements and oil and gas if you don't have you, you have order. you have no reason to be looking at those if you're not investing in real estate first. Right. And now if you've invested in real estate, and you can't find a deal that that makes sense for you, then look to plug those things in. Uh, of course, don't invest just for tax purposes. It needs to make a lot of sense when it comes down to buying uh, a property. Um, but Aaron's right. You know, uh, the first approach I would take is if I could buy great. And if I have still a tax liability after I buy, then I'm plugging in some of those MBA style courses. So, so let's talk about the, the, the one big thing that everyone, like what I was most excited to bring people to this call for. And, and this is something that, you know, I myself as a real estate agent and as a real estate investor, I didn't really come to the keen awareness of this strategy until really like the last year. Um, and this is something that, uh, why don't you explain the cost segregation and the bonus depreciation afforded to pretty much, I think everybody on this call is a real estate professional. So this is like, this is the one amazing gift that has been given to us and it's, it's not gonna be around forever, but you wanna talk about that, um, Daniel? Sure, and you want me to take it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, 
So share your screen. I mean, show show them the. Show I, them I will. The I want to show an example because it's sometimes when we when we're speaking, I'm a visual guy, so I want to see it. But let's start with this. Like part of it is um, reducing your tax liability doesn't make you an American, right? So it's it's about being a good steward of your money. And the question is, do you think you're a better steward than our federal government? Right. You've seen the news. You've seen all that stuff. Right. If you think you're not, give it to the government. They'll run the country how the country gets ran. But there's a benefit to investing in real estate because you're betting on America. Right. Aaron and I. And you know what? I'll bring up two of the ones that we did because Aaron and I just closed on two properties this quarter. Right. So they're very recent. And I'll show you the numbers of what that looks like. But by buying those properties, not only did we provide housing for people, but we also provide we bought a commercial strip center. So we bought um, we bought uh, two we got two units for businesses to be out of, to employ people, to consume and, and keep America going, right? So the question is, like, it, it's not being un-American. You're actually being more of an American to use the tax code uh, to invest in your country and you're benefited for that, right? You, there, you benefit from that. So uh, I want to start off by saying that because some people say, you know, you should pay your own fair share of taxes. Yeah, great. If you don't think you're going to be a good steward of that money, absolutely. Give it to the government. They'll take care of you, right? Um, but... Uh, <laughs> But at the end of the day, like I want to take care of my own family. I, my family's here for the long run. I'm looking at not my like the second and third generation. Right. So um, I'm betting on our country. Right. And I'm doing that buying real estate. So what I can do is I could I could show you an example of what a cost segregation is. But what a cost segregation is, you buy a property, say it's a million dollar property. Um, you know, a million dollar property, you put your down payment, 25, 25 percent down. So you put a quarter million dollars down. So the government will let you uh, depreciate that property for 27 and a half years. But you could do a cost seg study and actually take that depreciation accelerated the first year. So a property that I bought last year, I think it was about 900. And I ended up, they ended up letting me write off 325,000 of my income. So I invested 240,000. And I got- uh, As the down payment, you put in 240,000 towards this $900,000 property. Correct. Yeah. So not only did I invest on a fixed asset, the debt was fixed 25 year, uh, 25 uh, year mortgage, you know, 4% interest, which now with inflation numbers on the CPI, you could see is free money, negative interest, right? Uh, it's cash flowing. And, and, and then I'm, I'm able to take 325,000 of my income and, and make it go away. So I save if my federal tax rate is 37%, I save 120,000 in what I would be paying in taxes. So when you really look at it, I could pay the government that the, the taxes for that, right? Or, or I could invest in my own property. So I pay the government 110, 120,000 bucks. So I pay 240 and I invest in my own property, which provides cash flow, provides a leverage, hedging inflation, provides housing. And, and it's, a, it's a property that potentially in the future can also appreciate, right? So um, that, and that gets done with pre-tax money, really. Right, um, because I'm 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 getting that accelerated depreciation ahead of time, um, and and you could do that too if if you have a uh, you could do it on your own you could do it as a partnership or you could do it with somebody like Jeremiah where there's a, a GP that puts a fund together as long as they give you K ones then you could participate in that accelerated depreciation as well and get that tax strategy as well get that tax advantage. So do you have an example of uh, of, of something a slide there that we can you can share to really walk through these numbers because sure. uh, you, you know. Sure. Uh, th I was looking at a, a um, I was looking, I'm actually out here evaluating an opportunity myself for um, a retail strip mall. And it does not have to be, I want to, I want to mention with this, the strategy of cost segregation, effectively what you're doing, if you're putting 25% down on a property, you can probably with cost segregation, get a deduction equivalent to your entire down payment or more. So whatever you're putting down, you're going to be able to take as a tax deduction. Um, with through, through cost segregation. So this is, uh, you want to walk us through this example? Here's here? an example. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can. All right. So this is a property that I closed last year. This is the one that I think it was at a price at 930 and change, right? So this is an actual example. And then I'm going to show you the last two that we closed this quarter, just so you could see how easy, how easily we could pay no taxes by investing in, uh, in real estate, right? This is why it's one of my, one of the funnest ways to invest in most, I, I think, uh, the best ways to invest and, and reduce your tax liability. But so this property, uh, they the only could only depreciate building costs, not land. So the building cost was seven sixty eight. As you could see, they what was the total have, purchase price, Daniel? But this was, I think it was a purchase was eight sixty five, but the appraised value was higher. 
okay. so they went on the appraised value and then they gave me, uh, I believe it was 90% uh, of property value. So, okay. so with that, you know, it gave me about 325,000 in accelerated depreciation for, for last year, uh, which at 37% uh, estimated tax rate, it saved me about 100, 114,000 in, uh, in taxes. Right now, uh, I'll go into this one just because we just closed escrow on these two properties this last quarter, just to give you an example of how easily you could reduce some of your income by investing in yourself and what the numbers look like. So, for instance, if your taxable income this year is a million dollars and you're, we're just talking federal tax rate because the state plays a different game. Right. So federal tax rate. So you pay thirty seven thousand in taxes. I'm going to keep it simple. So not 37. A million dollars, you're going to pay 370000 in federal tax unless you're doing anything to mitigate. Yeah, and just keeping it simple because I know it's scaled up, but but here, let's just for the sake of this example and just to make it quick. So, you know, we bought two properties. This one right here, commercial strip center, and this eight-unit property in California. This one was, was out of state. Spent $4.3 million on this one. Got a seller carry. Our down payment was three twenty six on this property, which is it's a triple net building. Um, we, we're getting 32,000 in yearly, in yearly cash flow, 10% return. We're getting a cost seg on it. I'll have a, a million and $96,000 write-off on this one property, right? That's huge. How much did you guys put down on that building? 326. Got it. So, so you're putting on that particular one, it, it, it's, it was even higher. You're putting down 300,000 on a $4 million property Correct. and you're getting to write off about 25, a little more than 25% of the entire purchase price in year one as a tax deduction. That's right. So, so when you look at that now, that was, I, I threw in this one because we closed this one maybe a month prior to that one. This was an eight unit in California and we bought it for 965 down payment was 241. It's more traditional, 25% down. Uh, cost seg is going to give us about 347 uh, cash on cash, 9% on that yearly principal deduction, six, 6%, 15,000 a year. So this is an addition to the net worth. This one up here is going down 87,000 a year, right? So if you average, just take the cash on cash and the, the cost of the, the, the principal deduction, you're talking about 30% and 15%. Now, if you kind of summarize that quickly, uh, what you do is your taxable income at a million, um, when you, when you, if you have a large deduction like that, you have um, your, your, you actually have a rollover. I could roll over 456,000 in, in tax losses for next year. So mm -hmm. I already have 456,000 for next year as a write-off. So that income goes away, right? Um, so if you really think about it, so if, if, I, if I end up saving, you know, if I invest, you know, um, $567,000 and my cash on cash with principal reductions is about 156,000, I write off 1.43 million. My tax saving is 534,000. So when you when you when you look at that, how much did that really cost me? Like I'm able to write off 534,000, and it cost me 567. That's the power of so and of doing. And, that. and I would I would just add this in into this whole scenario right here. Daniel and I partnered on this, right? So it's not like either one of us came up with. $567,000. You know, money is never the issue if you find the right deal or if you find the right partner that you trust and that you work with. So, you know, I, I would invest with Brett in a heartbeat. I'm sure he would as well because we, we trust each other and we're on the same journey, right? So part of this whole process of the beauty of a cost segregation is that it, when you surround yourself with people that speak the same language, magical things happen, yeah. right? And, and that, that's one of the issues in real estate that we have is that nobody talks about money ever. I mean, when was the last time someone asked you your net worth? This call was probably the first time anybody, or for a lot of you, the first time anybody has asked you what your net worth is. So, you know, find people, surround yourself with people that are having these conversations that's the best way to alleviate taxes is by, by talking to these people. Sorry, Brett, I yeah. jumped in. No, 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 that's perfectly fine. I, I do want to point out that this concept of cost segregation, right? Buying a building and taking a deduction for say 25% of the, of the total value in year one, um, it, you can do with all different types of real estate. You can do it with, you can't do it with single family, your own primary residence, but you can do it with investment property. You can do it with multifamily properties. You can do it with Airbnb. 
A couple of caveats, it should be a property that you want to own for a long time. Okay, if you're going to buy a property and sell it in a couple of years, you don't want to you don't want to do cost segregation because you're going to have re, get something called recapture when you go to sell that property. So it's great for properties that you want to buy and hold. Now, if you own investment property already, say you've got a duplex or a fourplex or a single family rental, if it's over, what, what's your threshold, Daniel? Three or four hundred thousand? Yeah, uh, you know, I actually like to have it personally. I like to have it a little over half a million because it does cost money to do it. Yeah, you're going to pay a few grand for a cost segregation study. But I, like, for example, I own a um, an investment property in Tahoe. It's worth a million bucks, um, and I haven't done a cost segregation study on it. So I'm going to I'm going to pay for a cost. You muted yourself. Um, I have a, a, a property in Tahoe. It's worth about a million, and I'm going to do a cost segregation study between now and the end of the year, and it'll it'll entitle me to take a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar, twenty five percent of the value of that property deduction this year. And so, um, this concept is is an amazing way to to minimize or um, you know defer taxes on on your income this year. Now, like I said, there's a lot of different types of properties that you can do this with. So. Um, I wanted to bring out and call forward at this time in the call, one of our um, investment partners, um, Jeremiah Brochet, because in addition to um, commercial property, investment property, there's other asset classes you can do this with. And Jeremiah happens to be a specialist in uh, self-storage. And self-storage, if you haven't looked at it as an asset class to invest in, it's flipping amazing. It has one of the lowest construction costs and one of the highest uh, rents per square foot of any asset out there. Um, in addition, it's recession proof. Uh, when you know when the economy hits hard times, people in big houses, what do they do? They lose their house, they got to move into a rental. What do they do with all that stuff? They put it in storage. So I wanted to have um, Jeremiah take the floor here for a, a few minutes and talk to us a little bit, Jeremiah, about you know, say if somebody doesn't have the ability to go out and buy a uh, you know, a three, four hundred thousand dollar duplex between now and the end of the year, but they want to take advantage of something like cost segregation. Tell us a little bit about self storage and how um, they could potentially take advantage of that. Jeremiah, sure. are you there? Yeah, yeah. So Dan and Aaron, they they really laid it out nicely. So just just real sequential, uh, yeah, palatable steps. Yeah, a little right. bit about yourself and 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 the self storage space because I know um, you know we you and I have known each other for a bit here and. Um, I know you, you've got how many years experience now in, in self-storage? Uh, 10. 10. Yeah. And fit another five in manufactured housing. So yeah, I, I specialize in alternative commercial real estate assets. So I, you know, I, I, I was a, a realtor 20 years ago when I quit college. And uh, for me, I, I played the same game and still do play say, the same game where we, we need to find a way at the end of the year as real estate professionals to try to, invest every dollar that we can rather than pay taxes that that is the game and don't do a stupid investment but but that so i found that the benefits of of affordable housing and and also storage self-storage uh there was it really really fit with my investment plan uh and reasons being one is is storage it, like uh, you know brett was saying it's recession resistant it's uh, you know ups and downs if, if, if the market's going up people consume more items. I mean, it's so easy to consume. We all know that we all are, are Amazon Prime members and people have now snowmobiles and up north, they have ATVs, they have boats, they got everything, extra cars. Uh, next, strong cash flows every single month. So, you know, it, it, with technology, we're auto debiting their account. People, you know, it's a pain in the butt to go move your stuff. Uh, they, real estate costs, especially in California and in any of the major metro cities, uh, you, you, you have no space and less space than you ever did before. Uh, third is, is low capital expenditures. So that's, that's one of the reasons I liked it a lot. And I actually transitioned from apartments and some traditional commercial is, you know, at the end of the day, it, it looks good on paper that you have a million or two million in equity on some commercial property you have. But I kept feeding the properties every month. It was some, some new, I was either turning a unit by fixing carpet, paint, water lines, roofs. You know, with self-storage, if you build it right, you get, you know, your roads are taken care of and your roofs are taken care of. Uh, at the end of the day, there, it's, it's a 10 box. And if you have a manufactured housing community, 
I don't own the, the lots. I don't own the actual, the actual units. I own the land. So it's a land lease community. I, as long as I get them water, sewer, power, and the trash gets out of there, they pay a lot rent and that's it. So I wanted low capital expenditures and low overhead costs to operate it. And then lastly, it's an inefficient marketplace. So right now, the, the statistics are 20 to 30% of the assets are controlled by the five or six big public companies. And, when and you the say the assets, just to just to kind of to, to bring that up to speed, when you say twenty percent of the assets are controlled by five or six percent of the companies, you're saying in in the sector of self storage, twenty percent are 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 owned by I don't know what the big ones are U-Haul and public public storage, yeah. um, but eighty percent of these small mom and pops that Come own these, yeah. Come so so what's, your, what's your business model then? Yeah, so there's 50,000 facilities in the country. So 40, 35 to 40,000 are, are out there, ran inefficiently for the most part. So my business model is to go in there, find these assets, just like you guys find you know, real estate properties that you want to turn around and improve and you either sell them or rent them. I do the same thing with self-storage units and, and mobile home parks. So it, it, typical things like you know, perception is reality to the consumer. So what that means is if you have a, a, a crappy sign, you, have, you, know, you don't have a gate, it's not paved, it's muddy, it's not lit up, it looks dingy and dangerous. You know, if it's scary to go in, if my mom wouldn't want to go there, then people, I don't think a customer would either. So they drive by and a lot of people have you know, half a million dollar houses. They're going to uh, get a 10 by 10 or 10 by 20. Uh, they want a nice place to put their stuff. So it's very easy to come in there and do these capital improvements and significantly increase the cash flow and the value of the asset. So that's my plan, Brett. Got it. And so um, on that note, do you have an opportunity coming up with um, with Patriot that's that uh, people could participate in? And then if they do, if, if it is, if there is something coming up, what would that look like? Um, you know, what kind of opportunity or what what's the minimums that people could buy in at and what, uh, what could they take advantage of? Sure, sure. And, and these guys, how they articulated what to do with their uh, investing um, goals or how they invest is, I believe you should open up a real estate holdings company. So you guys have a, a realty company where you generate revenue, you pay your expenses, and then you, you have a net revenue. But I, I really suggest having a real estate holdings company. And then when you do that, you contribute capital every, every month or a year or however you want to do it, because you guys talked about budgets contribute capital into your real estate holdings company, and then, then you allocate that capital to an investment. And I say, you know, actively go invest it actively, go buy your own real estate, or you want to do it passively. And for me, passively, I'm a, I'm a GP or a sponsor, like Dan mentioned. So what that means is that I created a fund where I raise money from limited partners. I take that money, and then I go invest it in the business plan. I'll buy storage assets anywhere from a million to $10 million, improve those assets. All those assets are held collectively in a fund. So all the cash flow flows into the fund and then it's distributed out to the investors. After the investors get a preferred return, then that investment is then split in half between me, the general partner and my team and I pay, and all the different people there that run the facilities. And then the other half goes to the limited partners as the investors. So how that plays out is the minimum investment is fifty thousand. I'm raising twenty five million on the storage fund. The investment hold period is typically five to ten years. It's ideally a ten year hold because my business plan is to continue to aggregate the portfolio. Where I have forty four facilities right now, we're going to have you know, over a hundred facilities in the next ten years, and then sell at that point to one of the public companies. And that's where we really get the multiple that we want over the life of the investment as we continue to build up these, these storages. So the way that it looks for an investor here would be they would get typically all the losses. So what you guys kept talking about is if you made an investment of 50,000 or hundred thousand dollars, you know, all we, we do the cost segregation studies and we accelerate all the depreciation storage is really nice because all the interior partition walls, Pretty much everything inside the storage is movable because uh, we actually move do actually move the walls quite a bit if there's a demand for bigger units we'll change the walls but that allows us to classify that as personal property so what that means is just we can really really push uh, the depreciation so if someone invests for example last year anyone in the fund invested a hundred thousand dollars they got a hundred and ninety five thousand dollar loss in the same calendar year uh, of the invest, well, actually the, yeah, the same calendar year of the investment. 
And when we, let's 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 clarify that first statement because <clears throat> anyone who might not understand this language, right? It's, wait a second. I put in hundred thousand dollars and I get a hundred ninety five thousand dollar loss. Uh, I think what what you're saying is you get a hundred ninety five thousand dollar deduction because based on that accelerated depreciation that we're talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't want to confuse people that they <laughs> they're obligated with the loss or that they. Yeah. And yeah, so, so you put in a hundred grand and it washes out one hundred ninety five thousand in taxes. At least so think in, think in, about in, that though. Like you save seventy grand in taxes for your hundred thousand dollar investment. You get instead of giving that money to the IRS, it's like you gave Jeremiah thirty grand, but getting return on a hundred, right? It's it's freaking amazing. Yeah. So 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 let's talk about that then. For example, you know they they put in a hundred thousand. They they get you know last year's example. Obviously, it's going to vary slightly from year to year depending on the the, the conditions and circumstances, but. 195,000 deduction, what kind of return do they see on that, on those funds uh, as far as, you know, it's a, it's a long-term hold. So you're going to, they're going to be getting some of the cash flow that's coming off of that property. So what does that look like for, for example, in the scenario from last year's fund? Yeah. And this, this fund as well, are very similar terms. So Brett, it, this is what I pride myself on as in, when you guys look around at private equity, because I'm a private equity company and any of these other passive investments that you're looking at to invest in funds, that's private equity. So what I look at is, are the interests aligned for the investors, the passive investors and the general partners? So the first thing I wonder when I invest in anyone is how much skin in the game do you have? So for myself, I put in $2 million of my own money out of the, the last $15 million fund. Secondly, I have to personally guarantee all the loans because to get favorable financing, uh, there's not good non-recourse debt out there. And then thirdly, does the sponsor make money on fees from you as the investor first, or do they make money after they achieve their investment result? So uh, with the result that I, I have baked into the, uh, into the fund, the passive investor gets a 10% preferred return first. So that just means that it, as a capital investor, a limited partner, you get an A share in the fund, and that means that the first 10% of profits, the first 10% of cash flow has to flow to the investor first before anything is split up between the, the sponsor and the investor. And then secondly, after that, every quarter, if there's any additional cash flow, that, that cash flow is then split 50-50 with the investor and with us as the sponsors. So we, we roughly, we, last year, we hit a 15% cash on cash return to our investors. And why that's important is, you know, you'll see a lot of people say that there's 20 or 25% returns on their investment, but it, it's easy to bake in all the return at the end of the investment, where you call it the internal rate of return, the IRR on the investment. Because if you sell the asset and with the way values have gone up so significantly and you project you're going to sell the asset five years down the road at a ridiculous rate, you can, you can tell investors, yeah, you're going to make a 20, 25% return. But cash on cash is where the money really, it really, really hits your bank account. So we pay distributions monthly, which not many people do. So you give me, you give me money every month. As soon as we have the cash flow, typically takes three months for the property to start actually building up the cash flow. But the second you invest, you start accruing the 10% preferred return. And then that free cash flow is paid every single month to the investor. And that's, that's cash on cash. So it's not, it's not a projected return at the end of the investment. So I just wanted to make that clear. So, so, so for example, like last year's fund, hundred thousand dollar investment, they got a deduction equivalent to 195,000. And then for that hundred thousand invested, they, they were, they were, they saw a 15% return or they got $15,000 back on their, they're 100,000. But I think what's important is to point out what Daniel said. Had he not done any tax planning, that 100,000, right? Uh, 37,000 of it would have gone to would have gone to the federal government. So effectively, um, you know, you you really have uh, you know, you, it's 62,000, was it? Let's see, 60 what's what's the recipient 100,000 minus 37? Actually, you you yeah, 100,000 minus 37 is 63. You've got 63 thousand invested really uh, after you take out your tax deduction on a 200k write-off though you, you're actually saving 200,000 37 you're saving 75,000 in taxes and um you're getting that, a that's the power of growth tax pre-tax i mean think about that yeah. like if you were to pay taxes and then invest that money like you you would need to earn 150,000 and invest 100 grand 
Like, and, and it's, that's why it's okay to surf in others' wakes. If you don't have the mental capacity to run a property yourself, it's okay. There's amazing GPs like Jeremiah that know their shit in that asset class that, that could hit those doubles and singles and triples for you, right? Yeah. Um, but it's investing uh, with that tax strategy in mind as well. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to participating with you on this um, this this fund that that's that's coming up, Jeremiah. So if people wanted to learn um, a little bit more about Patriot Holdings and this type of uh, investment class, you know, um, how would they get a hold of you? Sure. 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 Thanks, Brett. Yeah. Thanks for having me on here. Uh, Aaron, thanks for making fun of my uh, sweater. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, it's patriotholdings.com. So it's real simple, patriotholdings.com. Uh, I just did a good uh, Spotify podcast interview with AJ Osborne. He has a self-storage income podcast. So that'll give you a better idea of the business plan. But, uh, and Dan, thanks for the shout out. You know, I, I, and I do, I, I do pride myself on being disciplined and only doing good value add deals. Because, uh, you know, Dan knows how to analyze you know, passive investments and it's very attractive right now for people to just buy assets for the sake of, you know, the tax benefit or just to place capital. But if you can't generate and create value, you know, you guys don't get the returns that you're looking for. And like you said, Brett, you know, it, but with taxes, fees and inflation, if you cut, if, if you let that eat into your annual return, you know, that compounding effect of the money is, is significantly redru- reduced. So one, just figure out, you know, don't pay taxes on the money, invest that money, and then make sure you can compound it in a way where you're not getting whittled away on, on fees and inflation. Because if you don't take action, you know, it, we just hit 6% inflation, you you know, your, your money's killing, it's, you're not creating anything with your money, you know, you're losing money. So yeah. it's just, you know, I don't need to tell you guys, you're already it's talking about the right thing. So you know, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to answer questions. Well, Jeremiah, thank you for um, coming out, sharing with us a little bit about the self-storage space, um, what, what, what cost segregation benefits look like in, in your industry and, and, uh, and sharing your information so people could dive a little deeper if they want to learn more about uh, investing in self-storage as an asset class. I love it because it's got great cash flow and it's got great uh, tax advantages. So um, we have gone over time. So I want to uh, thank everyone you know, here. But before we wrap it up, I, I just wanted to kind of in the chat, I know we covered a lot and I hope we didn't speak too much over people's heads. We started out the session, you know, talking about fundamentals, probably some things that people know. Um, but, but knowing that, you know, it's not about, it's not about knowing what to do. It's about doing what, you know, that's, what's really going to make the, make you successful. Um, but I'm curious, you know, how many of you learned at least one strategy or tactic? That's how, when I would go to seminars or workshops, man, I'm like, if I just take one nugget, one takeaway that, I could leave uh, that seminar, that workshop, that session with that I could apply to my business that would either make me or save me money, then it was worth the time. So just um, in the chat, if you wouldn't mind, uh, if, you've, if you got value out of today's session, just say yes. Um, and then the second question I have, any, any uh, do you guys get some, some value out of today's session? Some Steen, Susanna, Jessica, yes, yes. How many of you I would like to, to learn more and go a little deeper than we could in just this one hour? Because it was a little bit probably like drinking from a fire hose. Um, how many of you guys would like to, to take a little slower track down this, a little slower tack down this path and really um, put together a plan for yourself on how to build wealth? Okay, well, um, what we would like to do is um, we host a mastermind. So I, I mentioned I'm, I'm, my, my firm's called Real Estate Experts. I host a, a mastermind monthly. This is, this is one of the sessions called Real Estate Experts Mastermind. And so uh, I want to invite you all, Adela, if you're there, if you want to pull that up on the screen, um, to, to join the monthly mastermind. If you'd like to hear more from us, go to topagentinvestor.com. And Adela, if you can just tr- drop that in the link, H- oh, I can do it here. HTTP colon. And there, um, we'll ask you a couple of questions about what kind of content you would like to see going forward. But Daniel and Aaron have uh, volunteered the, themselves. Between now and the end of the year, Daniel, Aaron, and I will be doing a session on wealth building, starting with the first thing about getting clear. Identifying what your net worth is, um, determining what your burn rate is, and setting the five milestones um, to financial freedom. And knowing what those, those goals are to get you on track to becoming what we call a hundred percenter. And that is where you build an investment portfolio where your income from those investments 
equals or exceeds your cost of living. So if you would like to do that uh, and participate uh, in that session or any of these other sessions upcoming, go to topagentinvestor.com. And let's see, I'm gonna put it to all, everyone. And you know, Brett, I'm just gonna add something real quick to, to what you just said. Cause one of the things you said, I think is really, really important about building wealth. And you could, Daniel and I were talking about this earlier today. You can, you can have a good life just by doing the right things, right? Being a good person, you can have a good life. But I want to lead a great life. And the way that you lead a great life is you become really clear about what you want. You write those goals down and you listen to people who are farther along the journey than you. I've had more people throw ropes down to me than I could count. I know Daniel has as well as, as has Brett. We are where we are today, not because we're these amazing people, but because we had a lot of people give us perspective and advice and clarity and then simple steps to be able to, to, to help that vision grow to a reality. So when you said becoming clear about what you want and writing goals, that's how you tell your brain who the person you want to be is. And so, you know, I, I, I just know how much it's helped me with clarity and with goals. So when you said that, I just wanted to jump in and, and reiterate the importance of that. Awesome. Well, um, I super, I just, I want to acknowledge and appreciate uh, our pa guest panelists today. Uh, Aaron West, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and knowledge. Same with you, Daniel Del Real. And Jeremiah, um, I think he had to bounce. He's at actually another mastermind himself. Um, but uh, any thoughts or questions um, in closing before we wrap up? Thoughts, questions, or comments before we wrap up? Everyone is on mute, by the way. So if you're trying to speak right now, <laughs> I would I would leave I would leave everybody with this. Like if you don't prioritize your future and your financial picture or your or your own values, and then society will. And we're getting sold every single day. So uh, you need to take high accountability to that and prioritize your own life or else somebody else will do that for you. You bet. And uh, follow me on Instagram. I'm going to be posting, uh, start posting some wealth building uh, stories, tips, and tactic, tactics. So it's the Aaron.west on Instagram and uh, would love to help you on your journey. Awesome, guys. Thanks for joining us tonight and uh, we will be seeing you soon. Have a great one.